Turn in your Bibles to Ezekiel 16. You know that over the last few weeks, we've, we've taken a break from our normal studies because it was the resurrection season. And uh, I personally think that this year we had one of the best, if not the best, resurrection season we have ever had. I think last Wednesday night and the previous Sunday with our Palm Sunday baptism and then this past Resurrection Sunday, I just, I just think that God was working here at Calvary Chapel. And some good things have happened. People making decisions to follow Jesus, people making decisions to return to Jesus. So I was super excited about our resurrection season. And tonight we're going to return to the book of Ezekiel. And uh, we'll, we'll be jumping in with part two of a message that we started a few weeks ago on Wednesday night that we titled Parables of God's Discipline. And tonight will be part two. We'll be looking at chapters 16 and 17 of Ezekiel. But through Ezekiel, God speaks three parables to the southern kingdom of Judah to discipline them. And so two weeks ago, we looked at chapter 15. We looked at the parable of the fruitless vine. And that evening, we were reminded that Israel as a, a nation illustrated by a vine in chapter 15, was supposed to be a catalyst that drew the nations of the world to the God of the universe. And they weren't very successful at doing that. Uh, by the time Ezekiel's ministry is taking place, God basically says to Israel and, and specifically the southern kingdom of Judah, you've, you've borne nothing but bad fruit. And because of that, I'm going to gather you up and throw you into the fire to be burned. And so for them, it was prophecy. But for us, it's history. Ezekiel was talking about something that would happen down the road about five or six years. But we look back and we know that in 605 BC, Babylon sieged the city of Jerusalem. And then over the next 19 years, they carried three waves of Jewish captives away to Babylon, and then in 586 B.C. came the final destruction where the city was destroyed and the temple was destroyed, the wall was torn down, and the Jewish people were scattered throughout the nations. And so tonight we'll get into part two of this study, and we're going to look at two more parables of God's discipline, chapters 16 and 17. So let me pray and we'll get in. Lord, as we study the Old Testament uh, we're reminded that the Apostle Paul said that all things written beforehand are written for our benefit. So studying the Old Testament, Lord, always has an impact. It always points us to our need for Jesus. But Lord, tonight I believe that you'll point out a lot of things. Um, my prayer is that you would speak to every individual heart about their lives and how the things we study tonight impact them that each of us would have a personal encounter through the Holy Spirit with your word tonight in, in such a way that our lives would be shaken a little bit and that we would have to make some hard decisions. So speak to us tonight, Lord, through the book of Ezekiel. In Jesus' name, amen. So we have two more parables tonight, parables of God's discipline. And the first is in chapter 17, and we're going to call this the parable of the adulterous wife. It's chapter 16, I'm sorry, uh, Parable of the Adulterous Wife. And we have a lot of scripture to cover tonight. I think our first chapter is 63 or 64 verses, and then the second chapter is about 24 verses. So we're going to take this in big chunks. And so in the first 14 verses of chapter 16, God is speaking to the city of Jerusalem, and he's giving her a lesson on her origins. So listen very carefully to what Ezekiel writes. Verse 1, he says, Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations, and say, thus says the Lord God, to Jerusalem, your birth and your nativity are from the land of Canaan. Your father was an Amorite, and your mother was a Hittite. And so God is communicating now to the inhabitants of the city of Jerusalem. 
and, and talking to them about their origins. And he says that Jerusalem, reminds them, Jerusalem was originally a Canaanite city. It didn't belong to the Jews until the time that David took it. But the inhabitants of the city of Jerusalem, which was called Jebus before, um, they participated in all sorts of abominable lifestyles and abominable religious practices. We've studied those in depth in the past. And so in this chapter, God is going to accuse the city of Jerusalem of returning to her roots. He says, this is what you were before I had you, and you seem to have become that again. So look at verse 4. He says, as for your nativity, on the day that you were born, your navel cord was not cut, nor were you washed in water to cleanse you. You were not rubbed with salt nor wrapped in swaddling cloths. No eye pitied you to do any of these things to you, to have compassion on you, but you were thrown out into the open field where you yourself were loathed on the day you were born. And so I think we all know in this modern world that we live in that when a child is born, the things that are listed in verses 4 and 5 on a more modern way, in a more modern way, take place. I'll, I'll read about how it happened back in the day. The cord is always cut, and then the blood and the vernix, which is that, that white goopy stuff that a baby has covering its body when it comes out, that is all washed off. And then the baby's skin is rubbed with salt to condition the skin and to disinfect the skin. And then the, the baby is wrapped in swaddling cloths. These are just the basic loving things that you do for a newborn. And then I want you to notice in verse 6 that, that God enters the picture. He says, Jerusalem, you, you were like a baby that was born and just cast out into the field. And then God enters the picture in verse 6. When I passed by you and saw you struggling in your own blood, I said to you in your blood, live. Yes, I said to you in your blood, live. Now remember, this is a parable. And there's all sorts of symbolism in this chapter. And some of the symbolism that we're going to look at tonight is a bit graphic. And it's going to make us a bit uncomfortable as we study it, but I want you to picture God walking through the wilderness and he finds this abandoned newborn just kind of laying there about to die and God saves this newborn and then he raises her as his own. That's the picture that's being shown here. We get to verse seven and this is where it gets a little bit uncomfortable. God says, I made you thrive like a plant in the field and you grew, matured and became very beautiful. Your breasts were formed, your hair grew, but you were naked and bare. And so by the time we get to verse 7, the young girl, Jerusalem, has gone beyond the age of innocence and, and she's matured into a grown woman. And, and there are some graphic explanations here about her maturing into a grown woman. Notice the Lord says, that she now has breasts. And Hebrew scholars tell us that when the scripture says here, your hair grew, he, he's talking about pubic hair. He's talking about the idea that this young girl has grown to the time of sexual maturity. But then look at what else is written in the text. It says, but you were naked and, and bare. So the words naked and bare picture her without a moral compass to govern the idea that she's grown to the time of sexual maturity. And so you're getting the idea that what God is about to say is that she was sexually mature and then she started being promiscuous. Look at verse 8. When I passed by you again and looked upon you, indeed your time was the time of love. So I spread my wing over you and covered your nakedness. Yes, I swore an oath to you and entered into a covenant with you, and you became mine, says the Lord God. And so verse 8 is just filled with different biblical terms that describe marriage. Notice a couple of things. It says that God made a covenant 
with her, with the nation of Israel. He took her as his own wife. And then in verses 9 through 14, he goes on to describe all the benefits that she received as his wife. Just read through here. He says, Then I washed you in water. Yes, I thoroughly washed off your blood, and I anointed you with oil. And so God is describing here how at Mount Sinai, under Moses, he gave the nation of Israel the law to guide her conduct. That's the washing of water of the word. And then he gave her the anointing with oil. The Holy Spirit was involved in leading and guiding this nation. And then keep reading about how God adorned his new wife. I know husbands like to give their wives gifts. And and look at verse 10. He says, I clothed you in embroidered cloth and gave you sandals of badger skin. I clothed you with fine linen and covered you with silk. I adorned you with ornaments. I put bracelets on your wrists and a chain on your neck. I put a jewel in your nose, earrings in your ears, and a beautiful crown on your head. Thus you were adorned with gold and silver, and your clothing was of fine linen, silk, and embroidered cloth. You ate pastry of fine flour, honey, and oil. You were exceedingly beautiful and succeeded to royalty. Your fame went out among the nations because of your beauty, for it was perfect through my splendor which I had bestowed on you, says the Lord God. Now one of the things we don't want to do with parables is try to find an explanation for every little detail. But as you look at verses 10 through 14 that we just read, you see Israel's history. Think about the story of the Exodus and then the conquering of the land of Canaan and then all the way up to the time of David and Solomon where Israel rose to prominence among her neighbors and God adorned them with just the most amazing spiritual and physical blessings. God just says to Israel, listen, I found you. You were abandoned. I took you. I made you my own. And because of our relationship, I just lavished on you every gift possible. And, you know, the Apostle Paul, as I prayed earlier, he did tell us that all things are written for our benefit. Everything in the Old Testament points us to Jesus. And if you look up at the screen, I'll I'll give you a New Testament equivalent to what we just read. And it I'm not even going to do this justice because of time, but if you know Ephesians well, the book of Ephesians is all about the spiritual riches that we possess in Christ. And Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And then for the next six chapters, he just tells us about all of the amazing spiritual blessings that we've received in Christ. He talks about our wealth, our walk, and then he tells us how to properly stand in the battle, the war that we're in. And this is kind of the Old Testament equivalent to Ephesians 1.3. But, but let's go back a little bit. God said, you know, I, I found you in your sin and, and I cleansed you, I washed you with water and I anointed you with oil. Think of how Jesus found you and I abandoned in our sin. You know, and then he came and the word began to wash us and to transform us. And we've got the blessing of being filled with the Holy Spirit and gifted by the Holy Spirit to participate in the work that God is doing. Think about how he's clothed us with the righteousness of Christ and how he's transformed our lives. We are kind of talking about this on Sunday, on Resurrection Day. Just look back at what we once were and who the, man, the Lord has made us now. And, and I mean, in my case, it's an amazing transformation. And Kelly's even more, but we won't go there. I love you, babe. We're in separate cars. I can do this all night long if I want to. I don't have to walk home tonight. Verse 15 brings us to a real turning point in this parable. Up to this point, it's just been this beautiful love story. God's just telling Israel, you know, I, 
Uh, I found you. I, I took you as my own. I've just blessed your socks off. But as we get to verse 15, he says, but you trusted in your own beauty, played the harlot because of your fame and poured out your harlotry on everyone passing by who would have it. And this is a great description of how God views idolatry in the lives of his people. He uses the whole concept of spiritual adultery. To Israel, the father says, listen, you, you're my wife and you are committing spiritual adultery by cheating on me with these other idols. The church is the bride of Christ and Jesus could say the same. He could say to us, hey, you know, I'm a little bit jealous. I, I bought you, I cleansed you, I poured oil upon you, I've given you every blessing and you give me like 1% of your time and you give 99% of your time to things that have no eternal value. And so I've been praying that the Lord would just speak specifically to you and I tonight as I speak kind of generically. I want to speak generically and give the Holy Spirit the, the freedom to speak to every individual in the room specifically. You know, where, where might we be cheating on Jesus with our, our time or our passions or whatever it is? And so God tells Israel, after everything I've done for you, instead of being filled with humility and thanksgiving, you became prideful and, and you began cheating on me with all the idols of the people around you. Go to verse 16. He says, you took some of your garments and adorned multicolored high places for yourself. And you played the harlot on them. Such things should not happen nor be. You've also taken your beautiful jewelry from my gold and my silver, which I had given you and made for yourself male images and played the harlot with them. You took your embroidered garments and covered them. And you set my oil and my incense before them. Also my food, which I gave you, the pastry of fine flour, oil, and honey, which I fed you. You set it before them, in other words, the idols, as sweet incense. And so it was, says the Lord God. And so, as we saw in Hosea, the, the riches that God had blessed Judah with, they were supposed to be used to to give back to the Lord. Instead, the people were using them to honor their idols. So picture God giving this wonderful, abundant harvest to a family, and then that family takes some of that harvest, and they go and they offer it to a false god, to an idol. And they give that idol the credit for what God did. And when we were in Hosea a couple of weeks ago on a Sunday morning, we talked about the equivalent to this. It, it would maybe be like a man and God has blessed him with this fantastic job. And every week he gets this really nice paycheck, right? And he takes part of that paycheck and he uses it to go entertain himself with a prostitute. Or he pays a, a, a monthly subscription to a pornographic website or something like that, or he's taking part of what God has blessed him with and he's buying marijuana or, you know, street drugs or, you know, even oxy, whatever it is. He's got a dude that lives down the street that sells this stuff and God is blessing this guy's socks off and he's like, hey, it doesn't hurt my family a bit. I've got this cushion in my budget for me to party a little bit, me to have a little bit of fun. And, and God says, listen, that's not why I've blessed you with these abundant things. It's so that you can honor me with those things. Verse 20, he says, Moreover, you took your sons and your daughters whom you bore to me, and these you sacrificed to them to be devoured. In other words, you're sacrificing your children to Molech and to these other false gods of the land. He says, Were your acts of harlotry a small matter? that you have slain my children and offered them up by causing them to pass through the fire? And in all your abominations and acts of harlotry, you did not remember the days of your youth when you were naked and bare, struggling in your blood. God says, listen, you were lost, and then I saved you. 
And then I blessed you with children, and you turned around and sacrificed those children to false gods. And I know immediately whenever we talk about something like this, we think about the horrors of abortion, and and abortion really is a horrible thing. But we learned over the last couple of years since we began an abortion ministry that as much as 40% of people who attend churches today have somehow been impacted by an abortion. And so when I start thinking about that, I think my role as a pastor is not to pound the pulpit, but, but rather to, to do two things. And as a church, we do stand against abortion. We have a ministry where we try to help people make a choice not to have abortions. But I think as important with that is knowing that as many as 40% of people that might be here at Calvary Chapel who have somehow been involved in an abortion, I think we have a really strong responsibility to help them identify the problems that's causing in their life today and help them to overcome that, that they could find forgiveness through Jesus Christ and they could find restoration through the Holy Spirit that if they've been involved in something like that in the past, that God does not hate them, that God wants to help them and restore them and bring them back. So verse 22 here, I want you to notice that it all began when people became discontent with God and tried to fill the void with something else. Look back at verse 22. And in all your abominations and act of harlotry, You did not remember the days of your youth when you were naked and bare, struggling in your blood. We basically have a picture here where God is saying the reason that the people of Judah were doing this is they had backslidden. It's like the equivalent of saying that, that, you know, Jesus is our first love. But when Jesus is no longer our first love and he starts taking a back seat to other things, we start looking for fulfillment in other things. And we began backsliding and doing things that when we were on fire for the Lord, we thought, there's no way I would ever do that again. And yet, Christians find themselves in that place all the time because they don't maintain Jesus as their first love. Verse 23, then it was so, after all your wickedness, woe, woe to you, says the Lord God, that you also built for yourself a shrine and made a high place for yourself in every street. You, you built your high places at the head of every road and you made your beauty to be abhorred. You offered yourself to everyone who passed by and multiplied your acts of harlotry. In other words, he's saying you prostituted yourself to every idol available, okay? Okay. He says, you also committed harlotry with the Egyptians, your very fleshly neighbors, and increased your acts of harlotry to provoke me to anger. Behold, therefore, I stretched out my hand against you, diminished your allotment, and gave you up to the will of those who hate you, the daughters of the Philistines who were ashamed of your lewd behavior. You also played the harlot with the Assyrians because you were insatiable. Indeed, you played the harlot with them and still were not satisfied. Moreover, you multiplied your acts of harlotry as far as the land of the traitor Chaldea, that's Babylon, and even then you were not satisfied. We could spend a lot of time here, but what we're going to do is we're going to kind of draw a word picture. I want you to imagine a housewife living in some neighborhood and She's no longer content with the life that her husband is providing. And so being unsatisfied, she sleeps with the guy next door. And that doesn't fulfill her. So she sleeps with the guy across the street. That doesn't fulfill her. So at the time a little bit of time has gone by, she slept with almost every man in the neighborhood. And she still not having this void inside of her filled. And so, unfulfilled, she gets to the point where she just sleeps with every man she can possibly find that will sleep with her. And what God is getting at in the way he words this, he's saying, Israel, that's you. Judah, that's you. 
And he says, but I want you to think about this in the same way that like when the neighbors start tuning in to this woman in their neighborhood, everybody's just looking on going, what's wrong with her husband? What's wrong with that guy that his wife is so unsatisfied that she's sleeping with every man in town? And God says, do you see what you're doing to me? He says to Judah, by chasing after all these idols, you're basically saying that the God of Israel doesn't provide for you, doesn't satisfy you. He doesn't meet your needs. He just doesn't do it for you anymore. And you're saying to the nations around you that your God is just second rate. And it's interesting because when we get to verse 30, God says, I'm going to defend myself here. He, he says, there's nothing wrong with me. Look at verse 30. He says, how degenerate is your heart, says the Lord God, seeing you do all these things and the deeds of a brazen harlot. So God says to the people of Judah, look, you can make any excuse you want. You can say whatever you want to justify your sinful behavior, your spiritual adultery. But God says, listen, verse 30 is is really what's going on. You have a degenerate heart and you are brazen like a harlot. You're, you're, you're hard-hearted. And so that's God's main point in all of this. But there's another point we see back in verse 23 where he starts off and he says, whoa, 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 God is implying that judgment is coming. You think you're getting away with this, but no, judgment is coming. And, and then God has another point in verse 27 where he starts talking about how even like the Philistine women now remember Philistines were some wicked people and the Philistine women were no less wicked and God says listen Judah the Philistine women are looking down on you like oh my gosh those people are wicked and God says it's pretty bad when my people are being rightly judged by the most wicked people on the planet he says it doesn't say a lot for them. And so for you and I, the application here is that when a Christian does backslide, it really does send a message to the people around us. When you were on fire for the Lord and you were telling people about Jesus, you need to come to church and you need to get saved and I, you, you just, you don't know what you're missing. And then a a couple of months down the road, your friends see you backsliding and you're getting back into all the things you used to do. They look and they say, see, that's why I don't want to be a Christian because if Jesus doesn't fulfill you, why would I want him? So sometimes we think, you know, it's not that big of a deal if I just, you know, I'm not super duper on fire or if I kind of, I don't know, I'm going to take a flesh break this month or something like that. Your friends are watching. Your workmates are watching. And they're saying, you know, you're always preaching about how amazing it is being a Christian. Why have you returned to doing the same things I do if Jesus is so amazing? So I think God is just saying to the church, when we study portions of Scripture like this, don't backslide. Just guard your heart. Keep Jesus as your first love. Verse 31, God begins to illustrate the extent of Israel's sin. He says, you erected your shrine at the head of every road. You built your high place in every street. You were not like a harlot because you scorned payment. You were an adulterous wife who takes strangers instead of her husband. Men make payments to all harlots, but you made your payments to all your lovers and hired them to come to you from all around your harlotry. You are the opposite of other women in your harlotry because no one solicited you to be a harlot. In that, you gave payment, but no payment was given you. Therefore, you are the opposite. So God says, listen, prostitutes exchange sex for money. God says spiritual adultery costs you. You end up paying to worship all the wrong things. And then... We get to verse 35, God's judgment of Jerusalem is described in, in this last section. And we're going to read a lot of scripture right now. He says, now then, O harlot. <laughs> I just pause there for a minute. God is speaking to his wife 
the people of Judah. And he says, now then, O harlot, would you say they were in a bad place? They were in a bad place. He says, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, because your filthiness was poured out and your nakedness uncovered in your harlotry with your lovers and with all your abominable idols and because of the blood of your children which you gave to them, surely therefore I will gather all your lovers with whom you took pleasure, all those you loved and all those you hated. I will gather them from around against you and will uncover your nakedness to them, that they may see all your nakedness. And so he's describing the coming destruction of Jerusalem. And it wouldn't just be the Babylonians, but it would be other nations that took advantage of them at the time, nations of whom, whose gods they were worshiping at the time. He says, I'll judge you, verse 38, as, as women who break wedlock or shed blood are judged. I will bring blood upon you in fury and jealousy. And so murder and adultery under the law of Moses were capital crimes. And God says, hey, you've committed a couple of capital crimes here. And so I'm going to execute you. You're going to be executed for your crimes. I will also give you into their hand and they shall throw down your shrines and break down your high places. They shall also strip you of your clothes, take your beautiful jewelry and leave you naked and bare. And I find that interesting because back in the beginning of the chapter, when God found Israel, she was naked and bare. God made her rich and blessed. And God says, but when the Babylonians are done with you, you're going to be naked and bare again. You're going to have nothing. You're going to return to your former condition. Verse 40, they also, they shall also uh, bring up an assembly against you and they shall stone you with stones and thrust you through with their swords. They shall burn your houses with fire and execute judgments on you in the sight of many women. And I will make you cease playing the harlot, and you shall no longer hire lovers. So I will lay to rest my fury towards you, and my jealousy shall depart from you. I will be quiet and be angry no more, because you did not remember the days of your youth, but agitated me with all these things. Surely I will also recompense your deeds on your own head, says the Lord God. And you shall commit lewdness in addition to all your abominations. Indeed, everyone who quotes Proverbs will use this proverb against you. Like mother, like daughter. You remember before God rescued her, she was the daughter of Amorites and Hittites, you know, the Canaanite people. And now God says, your actions prove that you have returned to your roots. You are your mother's daughter, loathing husband and children, and you are the sister of your sisters who loathe their husbands and children. Your mother was a Hittite and your father an Amorite. Your elder sister is Samaria. Remember that Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel that had already been conquered by Assyria at this point. He says, who dwells with your daughters to the north of you. And your younger sister who dwells to the south of you is Sodom and her daughters. You did not walk in their ways nor act according to their abominations. But as if that were too little, you became more corrupt than they in all your ways. You're more corrupt than your cousins up north. You're more corrupt than the Sodomites down south. As I live, says the Lord God, neither your sister Sodom nor her daughters have done as you and your daughters have done. Now, we all know how bad Sodom and Gomorrah was, right? We talk about how God had to judge them with, with, you know, hellfire and brimstone from like a, like a nuclear attack before there were nuclear bombs. God looks at that city and just says, no, I'm wiping you out. And now he looks at Judah and he says, you're worse than they were. You were absolutely worse. Look, verse 49, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food and abundance of idleness, neither Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy, and they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw fit. I want to talk about the sin of Sodom for just a minute, because I think this is something that's misunderstood as you study the Bible. The account in Genesis 19 makes most people say that the sin of Sodom was homosexuality. But as we look at verse 49... It says that the true sin of Sodom was, notice this, first of all, pride. And we could call the next one prosperity. 
and then idleness, and then the refusal to care for the needy. God says these are the true sins of Sodom. But then verse 50 tells us how those four sins manifested in the lives of the people who lived in Sodom. Notice that they were haughty and they committed abomination before me. And so it was their pride and their haughtiness that manifested in doing things that God prohibited, such as homosexuality, and then not doing things that God commanded, such as using their prosperity to take care of the needy and the poor. And so you and I should consider this carefully because we live in a very prosperous nation where there's a lot of pride and there is a lot of prosperity and there is a lot of idleness. And I think we need to make sure that we don't repeat the things that Sodom did. Let's get this chapter finished up. Verse 51, he says, Samaria, this is the northern kingdom of Israel, did not commit half of your sins, but you have multiplied your abominations more than they and have justified your sisters by all the abominations which you have done. You who judged your sisters bear your own shame also because the sins which you committed were more abominable than theirs. They are more righteous than you. Yes, be disgraced also and bear your own shame because you justified your sisters. And so God is saying, in a sense, this is hard to understand these last couple of verses, but God is saying to the people of Judah, your sin is so bad, it makes the sin of Samaria and the sin of Sodom look justified. That's how bad Judah had gotten. Verse 53 says, When I bring back their captives, the captives of Sodom and her daughters and the captives of Samaria and her daughters, then I will also bring back the captives of your captivity among them, that you may bear your own shame and be disgraced by all you did when you comforted them. When your sisters Sodom and her daughters returned to their former state, and Samaria and her daughters return to their former state, then you and your daughters will return to your former state. For your sister Sodom was not a byword in your mouth in the days of your pride. Before your wickedness was uncovered, it was like the time of the reproach of the daughters of Syria and all those around her and of the daughters of the Philistines who despise you everywhere. You have paid for your lewdness and your abomination, says the Lord, for thus says the Lord God, I will deal with you as you have done, who despised the oath by breaking the covenant. And again, it's, it's hard to understand. There's a lot that we could take in there. But in a sense, God is saying to Judah, you are so wicked that in order to be fair to the people of Samaria and the people of Sodom, when I bring you back, I'm going to have to be kind to them somehow. God says, there's no way I could bring you back from Babylon and not do something kind for these other wicked people because God says, I would be totally unfair doing something like that. And maybe another way to understand this is to look at something that Jesus said to the inhabitants of a couple of cities during his ministry, cities where he had done great miracles, but the people wouldn't receive him. Matthew eleven twenty through 22 on the screen, it says, then Jesus began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. And he says, woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable, tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. So Jesus' words kind of give us an idea of what God is saying through Ezekiel. He's saying that his people had become so wicked that, that even the wicked people of the land were more righteous than them. But the chapter ends on a high note. This is really cool. He says, nevertheless... 59 verses of really heavy stuff, and then we get a nevertheless. This is like, it's, it's like a but God in the New Testament, right? Nevertheless, God says, I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth, and I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. Then you will remember your ways and be ashamed 
when you receive your older and your younger sisters, for I will give them to you for daughters, but not because of my covenant with you. And I will establish my covenant with you. Then you shall know that I am the Lord, that you may remember and be ashamed and never open your mouth anymore because of your shame. When I provide you an atonement for all you have done, says the Lord God. And in many words, what God does is he promises that their time in Babylon will lead them to genuine repentance. And their genuine repentance will result in God forgiving them and then restoring them to their land 70 years later. And so what we just looked at is the Old Testament equivalent to 1 John 1, verses 7 through 9. Look up at the screen. God says this through the Apostle John. He says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Pause right there. Every once in a while, a Christian gets to the point where they feel like, you know what, I've crossed the line. I've done more than God can ever forgive me of. John says, impossible. As long as you confess and you bring that sin to the foot of the cross, there's nothing Jesus won't forgive you of. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Can someone shout amen to that? All unrighteousness. Man, the Lord is so, so gracious. So that was chapter 16. We got plenty of time. It won't take us long to get through chapter 17. This is the final parable in this section, and it, this is the parable of the two eagles and the vine. Has anybody ever studied this? Anybody familiar with this? This is a very, very cool portion of scripture because I think I'm using proper theological terms here, but this is what we would call parabolic prophecy. It's told in its, its original form as a parable. But then you find out that it turns out to be a very, very detailed prophecy. And so we'll move quickly through chapter 17. I think you'll really be blessed by this. Notice verse 1. It says, the word of the Lord came to me saying, and I want to pause for a minute, just, just real quick. Both chapters that we studied tonight begin with similar words, and I love the fact that Ezekiel tells us over and over and over, I don't open my mouth unless God gives me something to say. And I love that, and I think we could all learn from that. I got to tell you that it is, it's scary how often Christians throw around that term, well, God told me, you know, well, God told me, the Lord told me. God told me. And then when you listen to people, it's like, yeah, God told me to divorce my wife and marry my secretary because my, my wife's not a believer, but my secretary is on fire for the Lord. And this affair we've been having for the last three years has been the most fulfilling time of my life, God told me. You know, so often when people use that term, God told me, it's to justify something that they know they shouldn't be doing. And you know, every once in a while, I'll, I'll be talking to somebody and it's a very serious situation and I joke about this but they they pull the God card you know I'm trying to give some biblical instruction and they whip out the God card Whoops. well God told me it's like well that trumps everything I've got because all I've got is the Bible but you know, God told you I love the fact that Ezekiel says the word of the Lord came to me and Ezekiel says listen if I'm going to open my mouth on behalf of the Lord I am going to make sure that I am telling you what the Lord said. And that's why here at Calvary we are so careful to study verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and book by book. Because I can stand here and tell you, listen, this is what God has to say to us today. We're going to read it right off of the pages of Scripture. And it's safe. I don't have to worry about God zapping my car with lightning on the way home. Now, he may do that because I say stupid things in the pulpit sometimes, but at least not because I'm lying on his behalf. And so verse 2, he says, Son of man, pose a riddle and speak a parable to the house of Israel and say, and pause there for a, a minute. God says, listen, I'm going to give you a parable, a riddle. And I want you to speak this. And then people who really want to know what I have to say 
well, they'll study and they'll figure it out. And so in a nutshell, this parable we're about to study is a, a prophecy of King Zedekiah's rebellion against the king of Babylon and then the judgment that would follow in his life. And if you want tonight when you go to bed, just to kind of get all the details, just simply read through 2 Kings 24 and 25. It'll fill in all the details that we don't have time to look at tonight. And so the parable occurs in verses 3 through 10, and then the interpretation is given in verses 11 through 23. But I'm going to save us time tonight, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to read through the parable section by section, then I'm going to insert the verses that give us the interpretation, and it's going to save us a great deal of time. So the parable begins in verse 3. Thus says the Lord, a great eagle with a lar- uh, excuse me, with large wings and long pinions, full of feathers of various colors, came to Lebanon and took from the cedar the highest branch. He cropped off its topmost young twig and carried it off to a land of trade. He set it in a city of merchants." So that's the first section of the parable. The interpretation of these verses comes in verses 11 and 12. Ezekiel says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Say now to the rebellious house, which is Jerusalem, Do you not know what these things mean? Tell them, indeed, the king of Babylon, he's the great eagle with the multicolored feathers, He went to Jerusalem and took its king. This turns out to be Jehoiachin. He's listed a few verses earlier as the highest um, branch of the cedar tree. And then we have the princes. These are the king's nobles. And he led them with him to Babylon, the land of trade. And so you know the story. Jehoiachin was the king when Babylon came and began conquering Jehoiachin and his nobles were marched off to Babylon. Back to the parable in verses 5 and 6. Then he took some of the seed of the land and he planted it in a fertile field. He placed it by abundant waters and set it like a willow tree. And it grew and became a spreading vine of low stature. Its branches turned towards him, but its roots were under it. So it became a vine, brought forth branches, and put forth shoots. And then the interpretation comes in verses 13 and 14. It says, He took the king's offspring, made a covenant with him, and put him under oath. Now, if you know the story, when Nebuchadnezzar conquered Judah, rather than destroying Judah immediately, Nebuchadnezzar made Jehoiachin's relative, we don't know exactly which, they think he was an uncle, could have been a son or a grandson or a, I'm just confusing things, so I'll just move on. But his name was Zedekiah. And he makes him a vassal king there in the city of Jerusalem, and he makes a covenant with him. He says, basically, I won't destroy your city, I'm going to make you the king, but basically you're my puppet and you will do what I tell you. I'll let you live and I won't destroy your city. And Zedekiah says, yeah, let's do it. Notice he also took away the mighty of the land that the kingdom might be brought low and not lift itself up. So remember that great men like Daniel and his three friends were taken to Babylon. The cream of the crop was taken out of the city of Jerusalem, and they were taken to Babylon for two reasons. Number one was to weaken Zedekiah's leadership team. If you take away all the cream of the crop, the smart guys and the the real savvy guys, the king doesn't have a strong cabinet to lean on. But also, those men were put in key positions to strengthen Babylon. And keep reading, but that by keeping his covenant, it might stand... And that's commenting on the fact that God's grace was shown through Nebuchadnezzar's decision to install Zedekiah and let Jerusalem stand rather than destroying it. I hope you're following the story. Go read 2 Kings 24 and 25 if you're missing things. So back to the parable, verses 7 and 8. But there was another great eagle with large wings and many feathers. And behold, this vine bent its roots towards him. And stretched its branches toward him from the garden terrace where it had been planted, that he might water it. 
It was planted in good soil by many waters to bring forth branches, bear fruit, and become a majestic vine. The interpretation is found in verse 15. It says, but he, this is Zedekiah, rebelled against him, that is Nebuchadnezzar, by sending his ambassadors to Egypt that they might give him horses and many people. Will he prosper? Will he who does such things escape? Can he break a covenant and still be delivered? And so the second great eagle that we read about is, is Egypt. And the vine, as I told you, is Zedekiah, the puppet king of Jerusalem. And what happened in the story is that Egypt comes along and entices Zedekiah to rebel against Babylon. And then Zedekiah breaks his oath to Babylon. He allies Judah with Egypt, and then he sent envoys to Egypt to bring back horses and a large army. He thinks, you know what? Egypt's going to come help. We're going to stand against Babylon. We're going to crush these Babylonians. And then verse 15 also contains a question. Can Zedekiah break his oath to Babylon and not suffer the consequences? You know, that's interesting. Sometimes people say, well, hey, I made a bad oath to a bad person, and, I, and God told me to break it, Right? And Jesus taught us that our yes is supposed to be yes and our no is no. I think it's Psalm chapter 15 talks about a man of integrity, keeps his word even to his own detriment. And here Zedekiah has got this idea that, well, hey, the Babylonians are conquering us. I, I made a covenant with them, but it's okay with God if I break it. Back to the parable in verses 9 and 10. Say, thus says the Lord God, will it thrive? Will he not pull up its roots, cut off its fruit, and leave it to wither? All of its spring leaves will wither, and no great power of, or many people will be needed to pluck it up by its roots. Behold, it is planted. Will it thrive? Will it not utterly wither when the east wind touches it? It will wither in the garden terrace where it grew. So the interpretation is found in verses 16 through 21. As I live, says the Lord God, surely in the place where the king dwells who made him king, whose oath he despised and whose covenant he broke, with him in the midst of Babylon he shall die. Nor will Pharaoh with his mighty army and great company do anything in the war when they heap up a siege mound and build a wall to cut off many persons. Since he despised the oath by breaking the covenant and in fact gave his hand and still did all these things, he shall not escape. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, as I live, surely my oath which he despised and my covenant which he broke, I will recompense on his own head. I will spread my net over him and he shall be taken in my snare. I will bring him to Babylon and try him there for the treason which, which, with which he which he committed against me. All his fugitives with all his troops shall fall by the sword, and those who remain shall be scattered to every wind, and you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken. And so I can summarize this by basically saying that it, because Zedekiah violated his oath to Nebuchadnezzar, and we know that this oath was ordained by God, you can read about that in Jeremiah 27, now God says Nebuchadnezzar's not going to spare the city. And then as Ezekiel explains, that this revolt meant that Zedekiah would die in Babylon. And you know, we also see here in the text that Pharaoh and Egypt would be of no help at all. And then in breaking his oath to Nebuchadnezzar, Zedekiah was also opposing God. Look, look at the text, verse 19. He says, I will bring down on his head my oath that he despised and my covenant that he broke. God had led him to make this oath in order to preserve the people and to preserve the city. So when he broke that oath, he wasn't just breaking an oath that he made to Nebuchadnezzar. He was breaking an oath that God had him make. And God says, I'm not going to let him get away with this. So the wording of the text makes it clear that God would see fit that Zedekiah was caught by Nebuchadnezzar and that he was brought to Babylon with his troops 
and killed by the sword, and you can read about that in 2 Kings 24, 3 through 7. And so the parables end with God's encouraging addendum. This is so cool because God gives these parables and he basically says, you know what, you guys, I'm going to have to judge everybody. I'm going to judge the king. I'm going to have to judge the people. But can you imagine being an inhabitant of Jerusalem? Someone who was walking with the Lord and you're like, God, I'm going to suffer because of the, the boneheadedness of the people around me. They won't listen to you. And, you know, I'm going to suffer the consequences of what my leaders have done. And so God adds an addendum to this parabolic prophecy. Verse 22, he says, Thus says the Lord God, I will take also one of the highest branches of the high cedar and set it out. I will crop off from the topmost of its young twigs a tender one. And I will plant it on a high and prominent mountain. On the mountain, let me start over. On the mountain height of Israel, I will plant it and it will bring forth boughs and bear fruit and be a majestic cedar. Under it will dwell birds of every sort. In the shadow of its branches they will dwell, and all the trees of the field shall know that I, the Lord, have brought down the high trees and exalted the low tree, dried up the green tree and made the dry tree flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken and have done it. I wish we had time to get into every detail, but I'm just going to give you a high-level overview here. You'll remember that we looked at two eagles in this parable. One was Nebuchadnezzar and one was Egypt. And neither of these eagles mentioned in the chapter could provide Judah with protection, could provide her with prosperity or anything like that. But God prophesies of this coming branch. And does that spur anything in your mind? A coming branch? That phrase is used by Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Zechariah to prophesy of the coming Messiah. And God says, I'm going to pull from the Davidic line a ruler who will rule and reign in a manner that draws all the nations of the earth to himself. And this is a prophecy of Jesus' millennial reign, a time when Israel is going to prosper like no other time before She's going to provide the surrounding nations with protection and prosperity rather than being their pawn like she was so many times. And this is the fulfillment of Israel being the head and not the tail, the lender and not the borrower. This is that time when God will fulfill all of those promises made to the nation of Israel that have not yet been fulfilled. Those come during the millennium. And so that was a lot of ground to cover tonight. We're still ending early. But I want to end by saying this. Chapter 16, you know, God basically looks at Judah and says, okay, I found you abandoned out in the wilderness. And I saved you. And I made you my wife. And I just poured out the most abundant blessings on you. And I don't know what happened, but a time came where you were no longer content with me as your husband. And you turned to every idolatrous thing. Jesus can say the same to the church. And, and sometimes he might have to look at individual members of the church and say, I used to be the center of your universe. And now I'm like a star way out somewhere. And I think that Jesus is just simply speaking to individual members of his body through Ezekiel chapter 16 tonight. And he's saying, if you have left your first love, there's a solution for you in Revelation chapter 3. The message to the church at Ephesus where Jesus says to them, remember from where you have fallen. Remember what it was like when Jesus was the center of your universe? And he says, repent. Repent whatever you've chased after, abandon it and come back. And he says, do the things you did at first. You're saying, well, my, my walk with the Lord is just boring now. Well, you probably don't read the word. You don't pray. You don't go to church. You know, whatever it is. Jesus is just saying, reignite that flame. 
And then chapter six, uh, 17, what I thought was so cool about this chapter was the end of it, where, where the Lord just says, because we're looking back on history, you know. This parable was super cool. You can see the fulfillment in 2 Kings 24 and 25. But the end, I wonder, are we looking forward to the rapture of the church and avoiding the tribulation and coming back with Jesus in Revelation chapter 20 to rule and reign upon this earth and to experience what a real government is supposed to be, where the king who sits on the throne is righteous, where he rules with a rod of iron, and where he gives you and I the opportunity. In fact, the blessing of reaping what we sowed in this life. We, we've learned through our New Testament studies that what we do in the kingdom age and in eternity is directly tied to our faithfulness here on earth. So I hope tonight you are anxiously awaiting the rapture of the church. And you're excited about the Bema Seat Judgment where the Lord is going to reward us for the faithfulness. What did we do with our time, our talent, and our treasure? And when we come back with him, we are going to be given responsibility and blessings to serve in his kingdom. And I know that probably all of us would be content to be a janitor in the kingdom. But don't you want to be a little more than that? I know that I do. Father, thank you for this study tonight. The book of Ezekiel has been so exciting and it's been so challenging. And if you've spoken to any of us about idolatry in our lives, help us to take that seriously. Jesus, we don't want to offend you by giving more of our attention to some worthless thing. If we need to remember from where we have fallen, if we need to repent of falling away from you, we definitely need to do the things we did at first when our walk with you was brand new. And I pray tonight, Lord, there would just be a revival in the individual hearts and lives of the people who heard this Bible study tonight. And then, Lord, I pray that we would be shifting our eyes off of the things of this world and we would return to having an eternal perspective, that we would live for eternity that what we do with our time, talent, and treasure, Lord, every day we would be deliberate about laying up treasure in heaven, about laying a foundation for going into the kingdom and hearing Jesus say something like, hey, uh, move up in the line a little bit. I'm giving you a promotion. <laughs> That's so awesome, Lord. Help us to be faithful and just, Lord, help us to fall deeper in love with you tonight. You have been so good to us. Help us, Lord, never to offend you by giving our heart to anything less than you. As we sing this closing song, Lord, I pray that maybe this would be the first step back towards you for some. Just reconnecting with you through worship. And I pray for a good time of fellowship in the next few minutes as we just hang out before we go home. Keep us safe. Bless the rest of this week. Bless our memorial service on Friday as we minister to the Ostrander family, Lord, and the O'Daniels. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. Let's sing.